My name is Father Steve Macias. I am the rector at St. Paul's Anglican Church in Los Altos, California. And this is part two of our Bishops in the Bible. We're going through Bishop Sutton's book, Captain and Court. It's an unpublished uh, PDF. And chapter two here is available on my website, stevemacias.com. I have it printed out here. It's called The Old Testament Royal Priesthood. And what this chapter does is it starts with the 18th chapter of the book of Exodus, and it says that the Old Testament priesthood is a model for the New Testament priesthood. Now this is, is difficult for people because uh, we've misunderstood the idea of priesthood and, lo and lots of American Christians don't understand priesthood apart from the idea of Levitical priesthood. When I say priest, a lot of people think of the temple priests, and that's true, the Levitical priesthood was one type of priest, but it's a different priesthood than what Christ belongs to. The priesthood that is the type or the model for the New Testament priesthood is not the Levitical priesthood, or not even the Aaronic priesthood, but rather the one that predates both of those, and that is the Melchizedekal, the, the priesthood of Melchizedek. And this is significant because that priesthood is the very same priesthood that we are told that Jesus is a priest into. We can make the argument that the baptism of Jesus by St. John the Baptist was this kind of introduction to the uh, royal priesthood, and that the community of the New Testament is called the royal priesthood. You can see that in, in 1 Peter or in the book of Hebrews, that we are a royal priesthood. Now, in the Reformation, this doctrine of the priesthood of all believers began to come out of these passages in the New Testament. But the priesthood of all believers is actually found there in the very beginnings of the book of Moses in this section of scripture. The priesthood of all believers can be found at its root in the Melchizedekal priesthood. Now to understand the priesthood there, we have to think of uh, one character, and that's the character here uh, in Exodus chapter 18, that's Jethro. Jethro is called a priest of Midian, and of course, you have to ask the question again, priest of what? Well, he can't be a Levitical priest. He can't be an Aaronic priest. So it only leaves one priesthood left, the royal priesthood of Melchizedek, uh, priest and king of Salem. So notice there that he's priest and king. Very similar language to the royal priesthood uh, that we see in the New Testament. So again, the point of this chapter uh, is this one line. The structure behind the New Testament church polity. So the ecclesiastical structures, the priesthood of the New Testament is the royal priesthood of the Old Testament. Meaning the, the corporate body found in Exodus chapter 18, often described as captains and courts, is the model for the church. Israel here is the model for ecclesia in the New Testament. And this is important for a couple of different reasons, but it's important because it has a certain type of hierarchy. It's a hierarchy that comes from the structure of the scripture. Now, hierarchy is kind of a bad word in our culture today because hierarchies are negative. We think of kings or monarchies. We think of male over female hierarchies. We think of corporate hierarchies. But the reality is hierarchy is inescapable in any culture. There's always somebody who has to make the decision, so there is inescapably a hierarchy. Now, what's powerful about the hierarchy and the priesthood of all believers that we find in the Old Testament is there are some principles that make the hierarchy a more equitable solution for the people of Israel. And here in the chapter, we have the explanation of how the Old Testament hierarchy, the priesthood of all believers in the writings of Moses and Jethro, actually supports all of the different aspects of, uh, of Jewish society. Now, he goes and says that these terms that they use, like captain and courts, are references to judicial and military titles because the hierarchy of the Old Testament priesthood is meant to do a couple of different things. It's meant to keep the pastoral balance that the, the priest kings, the royal priesthood of the Old Testament is first and foremost caring for the people. It's a pastoral thing. In fact, we see here that Jethro is responding to really Moses' burnout in handling all these different disputes to the people. So the captains and courts set up in Exodus 18 are primarily pastoral, hierarchical jurisdictions. 
Uh, then beyond there, the hierarchy is legal. It allows them to work out disputes for land or for crimes. The captains and courts now mitigate the burden on Moses alone and distribute it throughout the people of Israel. These thousands of people who now have localized uh, uh, legal authority. There's a certain symmetry that's important here, that this symmetry will also be found in the New Testament church, but the symmetrical nature of the hierarchy allows us to see that the legal jurisdictional authority of the people is able to be seen uh, at various different jurisdictions. This symmetrical nature is very similar to what ends up being kind of the American polity. You, you know that there are uh, federal governments, there's state governments, there's county governments, there's city governments, and each one is kind of a microcosm of the larger piece. So you have here in the United States at the very bottom, uh, the individual, then the family, then the city, then the county, but the family is a part of the whole. And so this symmetrical part says that even in the Old Testament, the individual was a part of Israel, and the same thing can be worked backwards. The captains and the courts represent this symmetrical nature of the hierarchy. That uh, the idea of representation was not diluted by numbers. Because what Moses is protecting is really what's happened in a lot of American Christianity. It's that personalities and power is easily consolidated either at the top through authority or at the bottom through autonomy. And so what captains and courts does is it allows people to have access to the, the law of God and to justice and ultimately to Moses through these layers of authority. So the individual at the bottom has the same access to Moses as the captain of, over these groups of people. But then because they're different units in these courts, uh, each unit functions in the same way. So that there's not a king making his own rules, but rather these, these smaller subsidiarity pieces that make sense in this uh, hierarchy of believers. So in one sense, you don't have an all-out democracy of the priesthood of all believers, where every single person is their own kingdom, but you also don't have the opposite, where you have one person ruling over everybody. There's really this middle ground, this, this symmetrical nature of the priesthood of all believers. Now. The other part here that's really important is it's participatory. The priesthood of all believers is not a hierarchy that excludes anybody. In fact, all the men of Israel are called to participate in this in some sense, either as witnesses, as jurors, as leaders themselves, and there's a way for them to move up the hierarchy based on merit or based on their fidelity to the covenant. And so while uh, episcopacy, or the idea of having bishops is often maligned because of how it's treated in the Roman church, you know, with a pope who's infallible, who's unquestionable, who sits upon a golden throne. The real meaning of the priesthood of all believers and, and episcopal government really sp spreads out authority. It makes it possible for all of us to have equal access uh, or equitable access to uh, places of authority and for the ability to move up in these places. So this chapter, and Captains and Courts focuses on hierarchy quite a bit. And it focuses on Jethro's model for the New Testament. And as we move on, we'll see how Jesus himself uses this language of Captains and Courts, both in his miracles and the way he picks his disciples to establish a Episcopal method of government. But what's also interesting to see is that the power still travels from God down through Moses down through captains, down to the individuals. That's contrary to other versions of church government which start with the individual, you know, congregational, sort of Presbyterians, that start at the individual. When those individuals come together, they pick an elder, the elders come together, they pick a synod. That's a, a bottom-up model of government which you don't see in the Old Testament. The diffusion goes the other direction, which is a model of Episcopal government. So captains have uh, these different levels of courts. Now, in the Episcopal model, this is shown in diocese, and we're going to show that a little bit in the future chapters. But go read Exodus chapter 18. Go download this chapter and see how these ideas, this pastoral, this legal, this symmetrical, participatory system 
is found in the priesthood of all believers under Jethro and the Melchizedekal system and how that is to be read on top of Jesus being the new Moses, right? So you have Moses in the Old Testament with the law, Jesus on the mountain who brings the Beatitudes, uh, Moses sets up his captains and courts, Jesus sets up his captains and courts beginning with his apostles, bishops, and so on. And so you can see that these two systems begin in the Old Testament and are merged together with the life of Jesus.